my very earliest childhood, I had heard both in song and story tales of the brutal oppression to which we were subjected to. Ireland, the first decade of the 20th century, a small group of young radicals begins to believe the impossible. It was the expression of a psychological need that man is the equal of his fellows and not to be exploited, derided or enslaved. Where successive Irish rebellions have failed before, this new generation believes they can force Britain, the most powerful empire of its age, to grant Ireland its independence. There are a lot of revolutionary moments in history, but very few of them are actually seized. Since the Act of Union of 1801, Ireland has been an integral part of the United Kingdom. Its people rule from London, subjects of the British Empire. The British Empire was really vast. You'll be very familiar with the Victorian map that was on the school classroom walls, where one quarter of the world's surface was coloured pink, famously. Around 1913, there'd have been 450 million colonial subjects, British colonial subjects. While Britain thrives, Ireland's economic progress stalls. Beyond an industrialised enclave in the northeast, agriculture dominates. There is widespread poverty in the countryside, while Dublin's extensive slums are notorious. Population is falling. Since the potato famine of the 1840s, millions have emigrated to America, Canada and Britain and the further reaches of the British Empire. Empire, it's a double-edged sword, really, for Ireland. You have terrible, terrible poverty. But on the other hand, many young, enterprising Irish middle-class people are doing very well out of it. By the late 1800s, an increasingly educated Catholic middle class begins to assert itself. Among the rising generation, many believe British rule to be the root of Ireland's woes. I felt they had no right or reason here. We were a separate island and we felt we owned it and we wanted at some day or stage to get them out. There's moments in history that are like zeitgeist moments when a consciousness shifts. And I think the early 1900s is one such moment. Across the world, people begin to agitate for equality, justice and an end to colonial rule. This is a period where the age of empires is transitioning into an age of nationalisms. And Ireland's story has to be seen in both that Europe and global context. The rise in nationalism, the rise in a drive for self-determination that's happening in other parts of Europe, in parts of Africa, in parts of Asia. This is, this is a kind of a worldwide phenomenon. We had this huge development in interconnections between different continents. And that fed the Irish people across the globe. It also brought back information. And radical ideas were able to spread through these systems. With Ireland scarred by poverty and inequality, Jim Larkin establishes the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union to fight for workers' rights and his fellow socialist, James Connolly, preaches that the cause of labour is the cause of Ireland. Feminism finds its voice as women advocate for equality and the right to vote. Fix your mind on the ideal of women enjoying the full rights of citizenship in their own nation. Radicals meet in the homes of fellow partisans, like that of Terence McSweeney in Cork, to discuss plans for an independent republic, fair, free and equal among the nations of the world. We shall rouse the world from a wicked dream 
of material greed, of tyrannical power, of corrupt politics, to the wonder of a regenerated spirit and a beautiful dream that will endure forever. Radical nationalists believe that Ireland's native culture, weakened by centuries of English dominance, must be strengthened to give the people a cause worth fighting for. Very many in the movement looked to our past, not the real past, but an image of the future that they projected back onto the past. They were trying to create a new world that would break the links with Britain and the empire. New organisations are established to regenerate Irish culture and bolster the nationalist cause. The Gaelic League is joined by thousands, including Patrick Pearce, Michael Collins and Maud Gaughan. We all want to counter whatever the enemy is trying to do. Before a year was out, we had three centres in Dublin teaching history, Irish, music and dancing. They're organizing Kayleys. They're bicycling all across the country. They're going to Irish college on their day off. The Gaelic League's annual Congress of 1913 is attended by many of the leaders of the revolution to come. And three future presidents of Ireland, including Eamon de Valera. It was in the Gaelic League that I realized best what our nation was and what had to be done in order to get the freedom that was necessary to realize ourselves again. What it shows the extent to which the Gaelic League and those other cultural organizations acted as almost a nursery of revolution. But for now, these radical nationalists have little support among the wider Irish public. They were regarded as kind of outsiders and almost as cranks. Mainstream Irish nationalism has a very different hero. John Redmond, leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Since the 1870s, the Irish Party has advocated in Parliament in London that Britain grant Ireland home rule. The Irish Parliamentary Party and its members, John Redmond, they're pragmatic, they're practical politicians. Home rule is the limit of their ambition. Home rule would give the Irish a subsidiary parliament in Dublin, but Ireland would remain subordinate within the United Kingdom. A solution that cannot satisfy the young radicals. In the general election of 1910, the Irish party wins a resounding victory in Ireland, leaving Redmond holding the balance of power in London's House of Commons. His price for supporting Henry Asquith's Liberal government? Home rule for Ireland. Asquith reluctantly agrees. In a sense, that should have been the crowning victory of the Irish party. They'd been struggling for three decades to achieve home rule. But the Home Rule Bill essentially causes a counter-revolutionary movement in Ulster. In Ireland's northern province of Ulster, the Protestant Unionist community led by Edward Carson staunchly opposes Irish Home Rule. Descended from Scottish and English planters who had been granted lands in Ireland in the 1600s, Unionists see their cultural and economic interests best served by remaining within the United Kingdom. We want the left to live uh, our own lives in, in our own way. Unionists vow to resist home rule by all means necessary. And in January 1913, they form and arm the Ulster Volunteer Force, a political militia that grows to be 100,000 strong. Concerned that the British government will not face down the Ulster Unionist threat, radical nationalists form their own paramilitary force, the Irish Volunteers. 
In early 1914, Republican women follow suit and establish Cumann Amman. Then, with Ireland seemingly on the brink of civil war, on August 4, 1914, Germany invades Belgium. Britain proclaims that it will protect the freedom of small nations and declares war on Germany. The First World War has begun. Carson calls on the Ulster volunteers to fight for Britain. Redmond also calls on the Irish volunteers to enlist. Both believe loyalty to Britain in the war will guarantee their side will triumph when peace returns. In the late summer of 1914, Irish nationalists and unionists marched together to war. But Redmond's call splits the Irish volunteers. A small minority refused to fight under a British flag. The most radical nationalists remain in Ireland, where some lay plans for a rebellion. April 1916. The First World War has already raged for almost two years, all sides suffering casualties on an unprecedented scale. They can't flee, they can't run. This is an appalling way to fight. Death comes from the sky. This is a period of almost apocalyptic disaster for Europe. They are facing an onslaught an industrialized form of death, which is unlike anything that European soldiers have witnessed before. The British government is fighting for its life in the First World War, and it allows Ireland to fester. It creates a vacuum and the independence movement that emerges just goes right in and fills that vacuum. You know the old phrase, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. With funds gathered by the Fenian movement in America, the rebellion is planned in secret by the Irish Republican Brotherhood. We came to the conclusion the time had come. On Easter Monday, April 24th, a small group consisting of Irish volunteers, Cumann and the Socialist Irish Citizen Army sees key buildings in Dublin's city centre. Outside the General Post Office, rebel leader Patrick Pearce reads the proclamation and declares an Irish Republic. Irish men and Irish women, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. We proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state and pledge our lives to the cause of its freedom, its welfare and its exaltation among the nations. It's just this incredibly dramatic moment which creates almost like a mythic starting point for Ireland's revolution. It's the birth of the Irish Republic. Easter week is one of these moments in history when a small but symbolic act of violence changes the whole political narrative. But the rising is doomed from the start. The rising in Dublin was a gesture. It was a desperation gesture when it happened. They knew it was. They knew they had no military chance whatsoever. 10,000 radical nationalists were expected. But owing to internal confusion and disagreement, less than 2,000 come out. And the rebellion is confined mainly to Dublin. Britain ships soldiers to Ireland and cordons off Dublin city. On Wednesday night, British artillery opens fire with devastating effect. Us chaps who were sent over to stop it all, I suppose our thoughts were as well, serves them right sort of thing. They started it and 
So they've got what they asked for. In the course of the week, almost 500 people lose their lives, many of them civilians. To avoid further civilian casualties, on Saturday, April 29th, Patrick Pierce surrenders. The rebels, including Constance Markovic and Eamon de Valera, are rounded up. As the prisoners are marched through the city, people are hostile, angered at the destruction the rebellion has caused. There were such shrieks of hatred. And the soldiers, luckily, guarded us very heavily on each side, two on each side of us. The women whose husbands were fighting in World War I or whose husbands had died in World War I, they were so angry about the 1916 Rising. All the G-men were unloosed on us, the G division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And they went around saying, you out, you out. They picked out all the leaders and... The leaders are court-martialed and taken to Dublin's Kilmainham Jail. This was seen as treason and treachery, and the British had to respond by shooting somebody. May 3rd, 1916. Rebel leaders Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and Tom Clark are the first to be executed by the firing squad. When these executions took place, that changed everything. Even though they might have been initially hostile or confused, people began to sort of say, well, maybe there's something in this. Like, what did these people die for, literally? Under mounting public pressure, Prime Minister Henry Asquith ends the executions. But the executions of 15 rebels, including poets, playwrights, socialists, and prominent Gaelic leaguers, has shocked the Irish people. Their hostility to the executions united the people. That brought a whole volume of support for our movement, for the cause, against an hostility to Britain. In response to that rebellion, the government arrests some 3,500 plus people, many of whom had absolutely nothing to do with the rising. This radicalizes the situation. Those arrested are deported and interned in prison camps like Frongok in Wales. Frongok detention camp became known as the University of Revolution. There are classes, there are discussions, there are lectures, and there's discussions of the lessons of Easter week. You can see that they spend their time talking about history, talking about politics, planning the future state, and perhaps most importantly, kind of creating a shared sense of identity. Frongok is the first time that most of these people have seen each other. They come from different parts of the country, and they're suddenly pulled together. So it allows leaders to emerge. The emerging leaders of the movement include Terence McSweeney, Thomas Ashe, Eamon de Valera, and Michael Collins. Who would have known of Michael Collins before Frongok? He's a nobody. After 1916, the Republican movement is basically kind of decimated and falls apart. And the Republican women then step into this breach. Immediately after the rising, Cumna Mann arranged masses. And that was the beginning of bringing the Republicans together. The women raise funds to support the prisoners' families and organise protests across Ireland demanding the prisoners' release. And the first kind of manifestation of republicanism as a popular political movement is actually through movements to free the prisoners and to support the prisoners. As war in Europe intensifies, the Battle of the Somme leaves a million and a half dead and wounded. The Loyalist, 
36th Ulster Division suffers more than 5,000 deaths. There was hardly a family in Ulster that wasn't affected in some way, either by the loss of fathers or brothers or cousins or relatives of some kind. And really, there was a cloud of sorrow over the whole province. Unionists come to equate their sacrifice at the Somme with the rebel sacrifices of 1916. Unionists see the 1916 Rising as essentially a stab in the back at a time of Britain's military difficulty. As pressure from Irish nationalists, including Irish party leader John Redmond, increases in December 1916, new Prime Minister David Lloyd George releases some of the prisoners who had been interned. Six months later, the rest are set free. When we were deported, I don't recollect a cheer or a smiling face at all. We were spat at and jeered, but it was different when we came back. Prisoners who were in jail, they were astonished when they came home. It was just a supremely extraordinary experience to have the country ready to make them welcome. Eamon de Valera, one of the few senior leaders to have survived the rebellion, stages his return to make a statement. When they arrive into Dunleary, de Valera orders the men to give three cheers for Ireland. And he then marches them down the gangway in military formation. So he's sending a message. These men are a disciplined body. These men are soldiers. And these men are led by Eamon de Valera. The free prisoners breathe new life into the movement and set to work reviving the Irish volunteers. We came back to McCroom. The volunteers had died down in the meantime. The ones who remained behind had simply marked time. And then we started our recruiting campaign again, and the, the reaction was entirely different. But the radicals have no clear strategy should they prepare for another rebellion or exert political pressure on the British Crown. Then, in 1917, opportunity knocks. Four by-elections must be held to fill seats left vacant by deceased Irish Parliamentary Party MPs. To contest the elections, the radical nationalists need a political party of their own. They find it in Sinn Féin, a tiny political party founded a decade earlier by the advanced nationalist, Arthur Griffith. Sinn Féin at the start of 1917, nobody really knows what it is. Sinn Féin was this small ginger group which existed in Dublin, led by Arthur Griffith, who was talking nonsense about dual monarchies and things like that before the rising. The fledgling Sinn Féin party gets to work. With Cumann Amon, Gaelic Cleagers and the Irish Volunteers, they travel the country canvassing for support. And they have a very clear message, which is full sovereign independence, out of the empire, Irish self-determination. In other words, a government without a monarch, a government without subjects, a government of citizens. Through Sinn Féin, the movement's radical message of an independent, egalitarian Gaelic Republic begins to find support. While for the first time in decades, John Redmond's once dominant Irish party starts to lose its grip on nationalist Ireland. In shock results, Sinn Féin candidates win all four by-elections. Sinn Féin's success in the four by-elections of 1917 worries the British establishment. Authorities in Dublin Castle decide to suppress the radical nationalist movement. Newspapers are shut down. Activists are arrested for making speeches. The flying of the Irish flag is banned. Volunteers start to be arrested for pretty petty offences, things like singing rebel songs, shouting slogans, up with the rebels, down with the king. In the British crackdown, 
Thomas Ash is arrested. Jailed in Dublin's Mountjoy prison, he goes on hunger strike. Prison authorities attempt to force feed him, but the operation goes wrong. Ash dies days later. And the person chosen to do the graveside operation is none other than Michael Collins. You have the volley of shots fired over the grave of Ash by armed volunteers. Colin steps forward to make his speech. He said, that volley that we have just heard is the only proper tribute that one should give over the grave of a dead Fenian. In a sense, it's a call to arms, a call to battle. In spite of the crackdown, the Irish volunteers see their ranks swell. But only the most militant nationalists want another rebellion and the bloodshed that that would bring. With tens of thousands of their countrymen fighting at the front, Irish people have had enough of war and killing. Death notices and telegrams were visited on almost every family or somebody knew someone who died in the First World War everywhere on the British Isles during this period. With Britain straining on the battlefields, the United States comes to its support and joins the war effort in April 1917. American President Woodrow Wilson calls for self-determination for all nations. National aspirations must be respected. Self-determination is not a mere phrase. It is an imperative principle of action. Wilson's rhetoric raises hopes among nationalists in Ireland and across the world that America may support their struggles for independence. In October 1917, buoyed by its by-election victories, Sinn Féin elects American-born Eamon de Valera as its party president. Sinn Féin seems unstoppable and then is stopped in three by-elections. The first three elections held under de Valera's leadership, Sinn Féin is defeated the Home Rule Party wins and feels that it is on the rise again, that it has a chance of fighting back. And then the British introduce conscription. Young men have been conscripted to military service in England, Scotland and Wales since 1916. But for fear of causing a political backlash, the Irish have been excluded. Facing a chronic manpower shortage in April 1918, the British government extends conscription to Ireland. Its worst fears are realised as Sinn Féin leads a broad-based wave of nationalist opposition. Sinn Féin really used the conscription crisis incredibly well to gain popularity. It's as important as the Eastern Rising. It's the second wave of bringing people into the movement. Common Amman organises mass petitions. The Catholic Church holds protest services. And the Labour movement organises one of Europe's first ever general strikes. Desperate to regain control of the Irish situation, authorities arrest leading Republicans, including Eamon de Valera. All political meetings and public assemblies are banned. But the ban is defied by the Irish people. The GAA organises Gaelic Sunday. 1,500 games are played and attended by 100,000 people on the same day. After four months of social protest, the London government concedes. Conscription is not extended to Ireland. November 11th, 1918. The First World War draws to an end. As many as 18 million soldiers and civilians have been killed. Much of Europe lies in ruins. The Allies have won but at a terrible cost. With the war's end comes a general election. 
For the first time, propertied women over 30 and all men over 21, regardless of economic position, are enfranchised, so tripling the electorate. When the votes are counted, the election of 1918 delivers a transformed political landscape. Winning 26 seats, Unionists express a clear no to a 32-county Irish national state. With just six seats, the Irish party is decimated. For Sinn Féin, winning 73 seats across Ireland, the result represents an historic victory for radical nationalism. Almost half the successful Sinn Féin candidates are in prison, including Arthur Griffith, Eamon de Valera, and the first woman to be elected to the British Parliament, Constance Markovic. The 1918 general election gives to Sinn Féin the one thing it has lacked, which is a mandate. The mandate is overwhelming. They have legitimised the Republican movement. It's the point at which the Irish electorate says, we're not happy with home rule anymore. We want independence. We want a republic. Now, what had been a relatively small voice has become a generalized voice. For the Irish to strike for self-determination, it's followed very closely around the world. And it's seen as kind of a check on what had been kind of the age of empires. The Sinn Féin representatives refused to take their seats in Westminster and instead, on the 21st of January 1919, they meet in Dublin's Mansion House. Here, they declare an Irish Republic and prepare to establish a fully independent state. We solemnly declare foreign government in Ireland to be an invasion. We claim for our national independence the recognition and support of every free nation in the world. There's a wonderful description of the first all by Maura Comerford. It's about how incredible it felt to be walking into the Mansion House and to be actually there and to have done it. There's the feeling that they're getting control of their own destinies, trying to think out how they're going to make a new country. I think for those who were there, it was a turning point, an inspirational moment. But we perhaps need to take a hard, cold look at this and say, well, really, the power that they wielded was, was very limited, and the power still rested with the British government at Westminster. The British reject independence uh, at that particular stage. They just reject. What do you mean you're independent? You're, you're part of the United Kingdom. You're part of the empire. Despite Britain's response, Manny and all Aaron remain hopeful that Britain can be persuaded through peaceful negotiation to grant Irish independence. But in the military wing of the Republican movement, others have a different view. They believe that Britain will only leave Ireland if it is forced out by the barrel of a gun. War must be faced. Blood must be shed. Not gleefully, but as a terrible necessity. Freedom must be had at any cost of suffering. The Irish Volunteers become known as the Irish Republican Army, and among its ranks, some will become household names. Ernie O'Malley, Dan Breen and Tom Barry. There's nothing romantic about war. I think it's bestial. The only war which I can justify to myself is the war of liberation. The IRA is to become a far greater force than the few whose names are remembered. Over 100,000 volunteers from all over Ireland will enlist in its ranks to support the cause. It is literally a people's army. It's of the people, it's of the community, it's of every parish in the country, literally. You're talking about well-educated, literate young men in their mid to late 20s. 
they are lower middle class Catholics primarily, but not exclusively. They are the sons of small farmers. They are skilled tradesmen. They are people who have a lot to gain if there is change in the country. The IRA will be aided by the women's republican organisation, Common Amon. The solidarity was something extraordinary. You had a completely new idea of life, it was what you could do for Ireland, and nothing else mattered. Upwards of 20,000 women will enlist nationwide. We don't pretend to be one voice. We're one people with many voices. But we all wanted freedom. January 21st, 1919. The same day Dáil Éireann meets in Dublin, the Republican military wing launches an unexpected attack. If we were to wait to get all from Dublin, nothing would ever happen. You just can't be waiting for someone on the door, 200 miles away to tell you to do something. You seize the opportunity and do it. In Solohead Beg, County Tipperary, two Royal Irish Constabulary officers escorting explosives are ambushed by a local IRA unit acting on their own initiative. The RIC men are shot dead. Mayo man James MacDonald leaves seven orphan children behind. The killing of the Irish police officers at Solo Headbag is condemned by many leading Republicans and by the Catholic Church. Common Amon and the IRA may be ready to fight against British rule, but as yet, few in Ireland want war visited upon their shores. For now, the IRA will hold its fire. Dáil Éireann remains intent on pursuing independence by non-violent means. With the First World War over, victorious Allied powers meet in France at the Paris Peace Conference to carve the territories of the vanquished between them. American President Woodrow Wilson has become a strong advocate for the self-determination of small nations. If President Wilson could be persuaded to support Irish independence at the Paris Peace Conference, they could win freedom. The Dáil Éireann delegation led by Sean T. O'Kelly travels to Paris to petition for the recognition of the Irish Republic. President of Dáil Éireann, Eamon de Valera, after a daring prison escape, travels to the United States of America, where he hopes to persuade the Irish diaspora to pressurise President Wilson to support Ireland's cause. The welcome de Valera received in America was unprecedented and absolutely off the scale. In Fenway Park in Boston, 60,000 people turned out to see him. A couple of weeks later in Wrigley Field in Chicago, he couldn't speak for 34 minutes because the crowd were cheering and applauding. San Francisco, Butte, Montana, Cleveland. Every city he went to, it was the same. You have to go back to the 19th century to see the roots of that connection. It's basically the famine and it's devastating. A million people die, a million people flee the country. Thousands end up on the east coast of America. And these Irish, some leave with the view that in Ireland's extreme hour of need, that the British government had failed the people. And hence, you have this memory bank which builds up in the United States amongst Irish Americans. And they want to see their homeland free of this oppression. The welcome that de Valera receives in America encourages Irish Republicans. In Paris, new national states have been created at the peace conference. Perhaps Ireland can succeed as well. The Versailles moment is in many ways one of huge hope and utopianism. There is a sense that this will remake the world, this will create a new, fairer, more just world, global system. 
and there'll be much more self-determination allowed to individual nations. Now, that doesn't come to fruition. From Britain's point of view, Ireland was probably a bloody pain in the neck. You know, they had bigger problems. They had bigger fish to fry. They had to think about the empire. The Irish are not the only people in the British Empire agitating for freedom. They have so many hot spots to worry about. Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and Ireland. Despite pressure from Irish America, Woodrow Wilson is convinced by British Prime Minister David Lloyd George to ignore Ireland's plea. And another door closes on Ireland's peaceful quest for freedom. Having held fire for four months, in May 1919, the IRA strikes again. Two Royal Irish Constabulary officers are shot dead as they escort a Republican prisoner at a railway station in County Limerick. As the face of British law and order in Ireland, the 12,000 strong RIC force becomes a prime target for Republicans. The RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, was the police force in Ireland. It was the most visual presence, and it was the eyes and the ears of the British government in Ireland. The police kept a file that time on practically anybody in the movement. They knew what you had for your breakfast, dinner, and supper if you had it. And they knew even what you were thinking of. Dáil Éireann fears that an all-out military campaign against British forces in Ireland would not be supported by the Irish people. Instead, Dáil Éireann calls for a boycott of the RIC and their families. Their children were shunned at school, their wives were shunned, they were completely ostracised. They couldn't even buy goods in the local shop. The strategy is make the RIC into pariahs and make their ability to function as a police force impossible. As the boycott takes effect, IRA headquarters are established in Dublin in the early summer of 1919 under the command of Chief of Staff Richard Mulcahy. Newly appointed IRA Head of Intelligence Michael Collins forms an IRA assassination unit. It becomes known as the Squad. I don't think people like Michael Collins or Richard Mulcahy think there's any question that the British can be forced to leave Ireland. I think they think they can make British occupation very, very painful. And they can deplete their willingness to stay. The squad's first targets are officers of the British Intelligence Unit, G Division. Men suspected of having identified the leaders of the 1916 rebellion, leading to their executions. July 30th, Detective Sergeant Patrick Smith is shot yards from his Dublin home. September 12th, Detective Daniel Hoey is killed outside a police station in Dublin city centre. These killings of senior detectives anger those loyal to the British Crown. Immediate action is demanded. As pressure mounts, Lloyd George decides to act. On September 12th, 1919, the IRA, Cumann Amon, Sinn Féin and Dáil Éireann are all outlawed. The suppression of the Doyle is the turning point. This is the crossing of the Rubicon. If you suppress the Doyle, you're removing the only legitimate vehicle that nationalism has for expressing its voice peacefully. There's no way back after that. With non-violent paths to independence closed, in late 1919, the IRA leadership makes the decision to go to war. January 3rd, 1920. IRA Cork No. 1 Brigade approaches Carrigtool RIC barracks in County Cork. After an hour's fighting, the RIC surrender. The rebels pull out with a haul of guns, bombs and ammunition. 
That same night, 60 IRA men attack Kilmurray RIC barracks west of Cork City. The RIC easily repel the attackers and the IRA men flee into the night. With the odds stacked against them, the IRA resorts to guerrilla war. Move quickly, be aggressive, be careful, and then disperse. Don't stick around and don't fight it out. Live to fight another day. Because of that, they're very hard to catch. The Irish Republican Army had one outstanding quality, that of suitability to its purpose. It was indeed the spear point of an uprising of a people. The IRA has 100,000 volunteers in its ranks, but with less than 3,000 rifles, very few see combat service. Those not fighting support in other ways. They were doing intelligence work, they were following people, they were opening letters, they were cutting wires, they were digging trenches, they were blocking bridges, they were cutting down trees. They were doing all sorts of support work, basically to make Ireland ungovernable. March 1920, eight RIC officers are killed in IRA attacks. Across Ireland, the RIC become increasingly concerned for their lives and safety. When these attacks quicken and when individual constables are being killed, a whole portion of the force want to have nothing to do with it. So resignations go through the roof. About a third of the force resign. The government sees a lot of its posts as extremely vulnerable, and so they withdraw from hundreds of barracks across the country just in about three or four months. By the end of 1920, 700 barracks are evacuated as the RIC retreats to the relative safety of large towns. And that leads us to a situation where the British state is no longer as visible or as powerful or as able to assert its control and authority in Ireland on a daily basis. You have senior British military figures going to a cabinet saying, we can wipe the IRA out in two or three weeks, you just need to give us the go ahead. But what's militarily possible and what's politically expedient are two very different things. To counter the IRA, War Secretary Winston Churchill develops a plan to recruit World War I veterans into a new armed auxiliary police force known as the Black and Tans. Decided to meet force with force, terror with terror. Their orders are to support the RIC and reassert British control in Ireland. They're told, take them out, kill as many as you have to, torture as many as you have to. You are released from the normal rules of war because you're not fighting the normal rules of war, and this is entirely their responsibility. I joined it because there were no jobs about, and things were pretty rough. And I went up to Whitehall for an interview, and I went to Ireland the same night. They'd seen the horrors of World War I, and within a year, they were being dispatched to Ireland to fight a guerrilla war. You can't imagine something so different. The IRA, they used to dig trenches in the road around the corners. You come across this and down and go your front wheels, wallop, straight in. And that's when they used to throw one or two homemade bombs. In the bombs, there was chilling night, bolts, pieces of iron, and scrap metal. And all you could do then was say, here, share that amongst you. Human beings are going to stand so much, and you're going to retaliate, aren't you? If your life's at stake, the other fellow's going before you. The IRA men are all hiding. You can't find the men. So who do you attack? You attack the family home. In the course of the war, Thousands of homes and properties throughout Ireland are attacked by Crown forces. We were ruthless to the marked degree of going to the limit of law and order. We'll put it that way. 
The pattern is usually that a crossley tender would arrive in the middle of the night with maybe 12 to 20 black and tans on board. They would kick the door in, stick a bayonet up against you, you know, and then they searched the house. And the search was really quite brutal. We see several cases of women who reported being raped, where the women's names and their full addresses were reported to add veracity to these stories that this was actually really happening. March 19th, 1920, RIC officer Joseph Murta is shot dead by the IRA in Cork City Centre. Hours later, RIC officers, their faces blackened in disguise, break into the home of Cork's democratically elected Republican Lord Mayor, Tomás McCurtain, and shoot him dead in front of his wife and son. McCurtain's death sparks outrage. 100,000 people line the city streets for his funeral. What Irish civil society is showing is that they have no appetite for British assassinations of Republican officials, even Republican officials who are involved in the IRA. Days later, the writer and IRA leader Terence McSweeney stands in City Hall as Cork's new Lord Mayor. One day, the consciousness of the country will be electrified by a great deed or a great sacrifice, and the multitude will break from lethargy and march with a shout for freedom in a true, a brave, and a beautiful sense. Easter Sunday, April 4th, 1920. Two weeks after McCurtain's death, IRA men march out across the land. Within hours, they have set 400 of the evacuated RIC barracks on fire. The flames confirm Britain's weakened authority over Ireland. The next day, Easter Monday, fourth anniversary of the 1916 rebellion, 50 Republicans go on hunger strike in Dublin's Mountjoy prison, demanding immediate release. When prison authorities refuse to negotiate, hundreds of common man women descend on the prison to support the hunger strikers. One of the most iconic photographs was that photograph of women on their knees praying outside of Mountjoy jail in that period in 1920. They used the power of prayer to make mass civil acts of disobedience. From the point of view of the government, in keeping public order, uh, it's easier to deal with a crowd of restless men than it is to deal with a crowd of restless women. You cannot really break up a demonstration of people who have come together ostensibly simply to pray. It's religion as a weapon, the rosary as a weapon. The women are not alone. The Irish Labour Trade Union Congress decides to call a national strike to force the British hand to release the hunger strikers. Across Ireland, hundreds of thousands join the national strike. So it was energy workers, it was water workers, it was, you know, road workers. Basically, the country couldn't operate without all these people. Lord French, Britain's Lord Lieutenant in Ireland, argues that the prisoners should be left to die. But British leaders are nervous fearing a social revolution like that led by Lenin in Russia. For the British government, this is a scary moment. They don't know what's going to happen next. After just two weeks, the government caves. The prisoners are released from Mountjoy prison. People within the British administration in Dublin Castle, in the police, in the military, are horrified. What is going to be the deterrent if you can go into prison and you can just not take food and you can be cut loose. Emboldened by their success, Republicans boycott Crown Courts. As Dáil Éireann establishes its own court system. 
Republicans take control over most of the administration in Ireland. People stop paying government taxes, giving their money instead to Republican funds. Railway workers embark on a six-month strike, causing disruption to British military operations. There's a Gandhian quality to this. We exist as a distinct people. And ultimately, there is nothing you can do to stop us from being the Irish nation. Lloyd George and his government realized by the middle of 1920 that large parts of the island have gone over to the enemy, are being controlled by the enemy. We must strike back. Somebody Churchill knew as a hard man, General Hugh Tudor is sent to Ireland. This country is ruled by gunmen. They must be put down. Tudor unleashes a new paramilitary group of elite British officers to support the Black and Tans and the RIC. They are known as the Auxiliaries. Police and military will patrol the country roads at least five times a week. When civilians are seen approaching, shout hands up. Should the order be not obeyed, shoot with effect. Crown forces employ collective punishment against local communities to discourage the people's support for the IRA. During 1920, scores of farm creameries are destroyed as Crown forces attack the very fabric of Irish rural life. That collective punishment, though, that's pretty much the last thing you want to do. Because the only thing that does is that creates a lot of animosity. It doesn't normalize conditions, it actually makes them worse. It destabilizes things even more. August 9th, 1920. In a further attempt to control Ireland, the British government enacts the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act. Hundreds of IRA volunteers are rounded up. Those who slip the net are forced to go on the run. And what eventually ends up happening is they start to gather in groups of anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40. And these become the nexus points of what will ultimately be the Flying Columns. The members of the Flying Columns are the most zealous of the Republicans. The number of ambushes doesn't dramatically increase. However, the casualties inflicted increases significantly. Flying columns rely on the people to hide and feed them as they live rough in ditches, hills and mountains across the land. We ate hedgehog in late winter, or stewed hare. We handled our weapons constantly to get the feel of them. Coming them on, smuggle weapons and messages and arrange safe havens for the IRA and Dáil Éireann members to hide. One of the big activities of coming them on was discovering safe houses because the men on the run, I mean, in Dublin, well, the leaders had to have not one, but four or five houses. So they had to support the community. They were able to disappear back into the community and re-emerge from it. And of course, that's what frustrated the British so much, the fact that they couldn't get them. August 12th, Cork Lord Mayor Terence McSweeney is arrested. Charged with sedition, he is sentenced to two years hard labour and sent to London's Brixton prison. McSweeney immediately goes on hunger strike. As a democratically elected politician, McSweeney's action captures global attention. So all the press from all over the world came to London and they watched day by day and every morning they would send out a bulletin the Lord Mayor's condition today. Appeals for his release are made by international governments and by Pope Benedict XV in Rome. But the British government remembers its humiliation by IRA hunger strikers in April and refuses to yield. The release of the Lord Mayor would have disastrous results in Ireland and would probably lead to the mutiny of both military and police in the south of Ireland. A 
As McSweeney endures his hunger strike, on August 22nd, a unit of the Cork IRA travels north. In Lisburn, they assassinate District Inspector Oswald Swansea in revenge for suspected involvement in the murder of Tomás McCurtain. Hours later, local loyalists retaliate by attacking Catholic homes and businesses in the town. Communal violence across much of Lisburn, first of all, 300 Catholic houses are burned and most of the Catholic population is expelled, but then actually spreads to other towns. In Belfast, Catholic workers are attacked by loyalists in the city shipyards. The Catholics flee. They were running, but there wasn't anyone actually in chase. Whatever had happened in the shipyard, they were so terrified that started to run and they just kept on running. Belfast IRA units retaliate, sparking the worst violence of the war in Ulster. After three weeks of fighting, 7,000 Catholics have been expelled from their jobs. 22 people are dead, hundreds wounded. September 20th, 1920. An IRA unit enters a pub on Drogheda Street in Balbriggan, north of Dublin, where RIC inspector Peter Burke is drinking with friends. The IRA opens fire, killing Burke. His death sparks an immediate reprisal. 140 black and tans and auxiliaries descend on Balbriggan, intent on revenge. The town will be destroyed. To realize the full horrors of that night, one has to think of bands of men inflamed with drink, raging about the streets, firing rifles wildly, burning houses here and there, loudly threatening to come again tonight and complete their work. By morning, Balbriggan lies in ruins. Two local Republicans, Seamus Lawless and Sean Gibbons, have been bayoneted to death. Over coming months, in response to further IRA killings and ambushes, Crown forces continue to conduct reprisal attacks. Hundreds of towns are looted and burnt. Innocent civilians are shot dead. By October 1920, with Dublin City under curfew, Resentment grows on both sides. Shopkeepers boycott Crown forces. Raids on private homes and businesses take place almost every day. With 9,000 troops in Dublin, British military cordon off entire city blocks to conduct room-by-room -room searches. It's a, a surreal world. You've got ordinary men and women and children going about their lives. But erupting into that world is this other world of a grenade being thrown, of a shooting, of a squad assassination. You had raids, arrests, you had counter assassinations by auxiliaries. This is taking place in a city that officially is still part of the United Kingdom. With 55,000 troops and 15,000 armed police on the ground, Crown forces feel that they have finally regained control of Ireland. Lloyd George announces that he has murder by the throat. But Lloyd George has failed to take account of how Terence McSweeney's hunger strike is capturing the world's attention. There were demonstrations around the world Barcelona, South America, all across the states. Even the stevedores in New York Harbor wouldn't empty British cargo ships. So the king asked the prime minister, could he not put an end to this? And the prime minister said, no. Each day, friends and family stand in solidarity with McSweeney's wife, Muriel, 
at Brixton Prison. Terence asked me to remain friends with his wife, you know, and I was trying to reassure him that we would look after her. At this time, the weight of the bedclothes was too much. To lift his finger was agony, you know. On October 25th, having survived 74 days without food, Terence McSweeney dies. His death elicits a global outcry. It is one of the great propaganda coups of the history of any nationalist movement, I think. The international interest that follows McSweeney is absolutely extraordinary. His name is known all over the world. McSweeney's body is met by huge crowds and it is returned home to Cork City. Tens of thousands march behind the coffin with acting president Arthur Griffith at the head. It is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can suffer the most, who will conquer. McSweeney becomes this story which other oppressed peoples identified as a kind of heroic moment of resistance to empire. In late 1920, Britain's government sends the first peace feelers to Ireland's underground government, Dáil Éireann. Stop the police and soldiers being murdered in return for the British ceasing reprisals. Not all on the British side, however, support moves towards peace. If there were a truce, it would be an admission that we were beaten. It might lead to our having to give up Ireland. The British government demands that the IRA disarm before any talk of negotiations can begin. The IRA refuses. Realities on the ground then change the political calculus for both sides. During the summer and autumn of 1920, British intelligence and the castle and the police are starting to get their act together. To break the rebel movement in Ireland, Britain assembles a new military intelligence unit known as the Cairo Gang. Michael Collins, through his own intelligence network, learns of their existence and decides to strike first. He locates their home addresses and arranges for IRA assassins to attack them all at the same time on the same day for maximum effect. Sunday, November 21st, 1920. The assassins gather in Dublin's city centre. We agreed that we'd meet outside St Andrew's Church in Westland Row at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Somebody's got mass that morning there. Following orders, the men spread out through the city by foot and by tram. At each house, the assassins force their way inside. Some victims are killed in front of their wives. I put the two up against the wall. I said, the Lord, have mercy on your souls. I plugged the two of them. By mid-morning, 15 men are dead. There was a great sense of rage. Their bodies are laying out in Dublin Castle in covered in blood. And the soldiers in and around Dublin Castle are just going mad with anger and rage. On the afternoon of this bloody Sunday, thousands attend a Gaelic football match between Dublin and Tipperary at Dublin's Croke Park. 
A unit of British auxiliaries is sent to the stadium to search and question the spectators. I was at that time able to take a free into the Dublin goal when the next thing happened was fire was opened from the canal end of the field. The auxiliaries shoot indiscriminately into the crowded stadium. People run in panic. Several are crushed to death in the stampede. Tipperary player Michael Hogan tries to crawl to safety from the pitch, but is shot dead. When the attack is over, 14 people have been killed, including three young boys. Bloody Sunday makes headlines around the world, and particularly in Britain. But it is not the killing of intelligence agents that principally exercises the public mind. It is the killing of sports fans in Croke Park. It's bringing into stark relief that the British are not a humanitarian beacon, that they're willing to use violence against civilians. They are proving that their empire doesn't rest on elevated ideas and principles, that it's actually just based on brute force. That really demoralizes the British people. That's not how they perceive themselves. But Minister for War, Winston Churchill, is determined to stay the course. Are we now, fresh from victory in the Great War, to collapse miserably and impotently before the meanest, basest and feeblest of foes? Five days after Bloody Sunday, Galway brothers Paddy and Henry Lochnan are arrested in South Galway for IRA involvement. They were taken from the field where they were helping to harvest and they were brutally beaten. Uh, they were dragged behind a car, they were shot and they were ultimately left in a bog. And when their bodies were found, they were burned as well. Poe's photographs are taken of the brothers' mutilated bodies. This is kind of typical of what the Republicans do is when the British use force they broadcast it. The Loch Nan case is published in the Irish Bulletin, Dáil Éireann's propaganda paper. The Bulletin is produced by Kathleen McKenna, who gathers material for each edition as she rides her bicycle around Dublin. Written and printed in secret, the Irish Bulletin chronicles British repression in Ireland. Copies are distributed across the world by expatriates through a network of unofficial embassies in the United States, Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. Any war that's being documented every day would become unpopular. Any war where you see the actual brutality, where it's shown in your face, where you get the details, no war like that will survive in the court of public opinion. In the weeks after Bloody Sunday, IRA flying columns increase their actions against British forces, targeting the auxiliaries in particular. Towards the end of 1920, the pressure was mounting. These auxiliaries had gone right through Ireland, burning and shooting and pillaging. And they had to be stopped. November 28th, two days after the Loch Nan killings, a 36-man IRA flying column makes its way to a remote country road in Kilmichael, West Cork. They are led by Tom Barry, a First World War veteran with extensive combat experience. It rained all night as we marched, and uh, we got here without anybody knowing it. We came across fields and through boreens, and the men were soaking wet. From 8 o'clock in the morning, they were in their positions, and they weren't allowed to lift their head in case they'd be observed. As dusk falls, Barry flags down two lorries carrying 18 auxiliaries. When the lorries slow, the rebels open fire. Seventeen of the 18 auxiliaries are killed. Controversy surrounds the event to this day. I shouted to the section, keep firing and don't stop till I tell you. 
these are former officers of the First World War, with combat experience, and they are wiped out by basically half-trained small farmers and farm laborers in an obscure by road in West Cork. And so that's really shocking to the British psyche. Britain responds to kill Michael and other IRA attacks in the region by introducing martial law to Munster on December 10th. The next day, December 11th, the IRA attacks an auxiliary unit at Dillon's Cross, Cork City. One soldier is killed, several are injured. This is a spark then for an extraordinary night of arson, of damage, of destruction. Probably the biggest single act of destruction in the whole period, the single biggest reprisal in the whole period. That night, British Crown forces descend on Cork. He started in revenge for the casualties we'd received in the ambush. We had 11 casualties there. They were completely out of control. They were looting, they were sacking, they were stealing, they were harassing people and then they proceed down into the city centre, ending up destroying most of Patrick Street, the commercial centre of Cork. I woke up to see the flames reflected through the north window on the wall, and I thought it was an Aurora Bora Alice, which we had seen the week before, and I called my father, and he said, no, he said, it's the damn British burning Cork. Soon large parts of the city are in flames. Five acres of the city are left in ruins. More than 2,000 people lose their jobs as a direct result. And the next day when you went down, there was nothing, nothing left. Rubble and the smell of smoke. The images from Cork go all over the world. It's described as the Irish Louvain after the Belgian city, of course, famously destroyed by the Germans in 1914. Britain had told its people that it was going to war in 1914 to save the poor civilians in Belgium. Millions killed. And here we are a couple of years later, and the British are doing in Irish towns and cities what they saw the Germans do in Belgium. Only in Ulster, despite a divided community and armed militias, is the conflict less a constant of daily life. The Unionist community regard membership of the United Kingdom as their ancestral birthright. They want no part of the Irish independence project. Instead, they demand a political solution to the Irish question that recognizes their rights. What is self-determination? It's the idea that different nation states should reflect peoples, the identity of peoples. And the problem in Ireland is that different peoples coexist in the one territory. Under pressure from domestic and external forces, the British cabinet develops a solution which they hope will satisfy the conflicting demands of Irish nationalists and Ulster unionists two home rule parliaments, one for the south and one for the north. On December 23rd, the Government of Ireland Act 1920, a British and Unionist solution to the Irish question, drafted with no input from Irish nationalists, is enacted at Westminster. Under the Act, a new territory is established within the United Kingdom. Consisting of six of the nine counties of Ulster, it is called Northern Ireland. So the one part of Ireland that has campaigned against Home Rule most vigorously is the one part that ultimately ends up getting it. On the very day the Government of Ireland Act is passed, Eamon de Valera returns to Ireland after his 18-month mission to the United States. Having failed to convince the US administration to recognise the Irish Republic. Sensing an opportunity, Britain sends discreet petitions to the returned president to gauge his appetite for peace. 
De Valera refuses to negotiate. Despite these peace feelers, the war grinds on. British forces are infinitely stronger. But IRA attacks and military targets are on the increase and spreading to new parts of the country. It's a war of attrition. It's an increasingly vicious war, and it really is getting to the end game. Ruthless methods of attacking people, ruthless counter-assassination. So if the IRA shot somebody, within a couple of weeks, somebody else would be shot. In the course of the war, the IRA executes almost 200 people as suspected informers. Their bodies often left in ditches as warnings to others. Essentially, you had a period of anarchy where there was no law and order, limited law enforcement, and the Protestant community was particularly exposed in this period. The gentry class was hit hardest. They were forced out. The house burnings, arson attacks. They were attacked not because they were Protestants, but because they actively supported the old regime. Scores of great houses are burnt and destroyed during the war. Their ruins will mark the land for generations to come. Much of the countryside becomes ungovernable for the British, as rebel leaders, including Liam Lynch, Michael Kilroy and Frank Aiken, escalate armed attacks. On the Irish side, it was a calculation. Well, the more we can up the ante, the sooner they'll get out. Get the bloody British army out of Ireland. Spring, 1921. The Republican propaganda machine is in overdrive. Journalists are brought to Ireland to see the impact of the war. The American Committee for Relief in Ireland publicizes Irish suffering and raises funds which are distributed by the Irish White Cross. In March 1921, an American delegation visits 95 locations in Ireland, including Balbriggan and Cork, to witness the impact of British actions firsthand. With support from figures like US President Warren Harding and Pope Benedict XV, these humanitarian initiatives put pressure on the British government to end the war in Ireland. But the British continue the reprisal attacks. Over 150 are conducted in the first months of 1921. The Irish people are weary they find themselves under martial law. And having this massive militarization of Ireland. And so, of course, as time goes on, they become increasingly resentful. Though some commanders, like Flory O'Donoghue in Cork, remain confident, by May 1921, Michael Collins and the IRA GHQ are becoming concerned about the rebels' capability to continue the fight. The organization was good, the morale was good, but we had no arms. The gun running into Ireland has been cut off. Collins has a number of attempts to get guns from the European continent, and they're blocked in various places. So he is very conscious of gun supply and ammunition supply. With the British news tightening, Republicans decide to launch a spectacular attack in Dublin that will grab headlines and announce that the IRA is still in business. May 25th, 1921, 100 volunteers attack Dublin's Custom House, seat of British local government in Ireland, and set it on fire. A passing auxiliary patrol sees the blaze and surrounds the building. A gun battle flares for an hour until the outgunned and outnumbered rebels are forced to surrender. In military terms, it, it, it's a choke. And it's only after that that Collins and De Valera both see, look, we've got to get a deal of some sort as soon as we can. Yes, the British are wobbling, but we're wobbling too. And we've got to conceal the fact that we're wobbling from them sufficiently long for them to wobble first.
On May 24th, the day before the Custom House attack, in the general election for the 26th County Southern Home Rule Parliament, called under the Government of Ireland Act, all 124 Sinn Féin representatives are returned unopposed. We had the spirit of the people with us, old and young. It was that support that kept us, not guns or hand grenades or anything else. And what the British government finally realized is that no government that they instill on the Irish people is going to be accepted as legitimate. We are defeated. There is nothing else but to draft 400,000 men and exterminate the whole population of the country. And we're not willing to do that. The coercive policies of the British really backfired on them. And it was the public opinion in Britain, influenced by the journalism, that put pressure on the British to come to the negotiating table. On July 11th, 1921, both sides agreed to declare a truce and the Irish War of Independence comes to an end. The Republican forces carrying on this guerrilla war have essentially brought the might of the British Empire to a standstill. Over 2,000 people have lost their lives. Swathes of Ireland's villages, towns and cities have been destroyed. Thousands of Northern Catholics and Southern Protestants are migrating. Ireland has been radically changed. But Nationalist Ireland's quest for independence is not yet over. First, Republicans must negotiate with the leading statesmen of the British Empire. The Irish delegation, led by Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins, faces a formidable team, led by David Lloyd George, Lord Birkenhead and Winston Churchill. To most intelligent political observers, it would have been clear what's going to happen in the summer of 1921. Britain wanted the Irish to accept home rule, and that was no longer acceptable. Sinn Féin wanted a republic. Britain were unwilling to give that. The British fear that granting the Irish a republic might spark insurrections by other colonised peoples in Asia and Africa, which would undermine the British Empire. A 32-county Ireland is also ruled out by the British. Northern Ireland, they insist, must remain in the United Kingdom. After five months of fraught negotiations, in December 1921, the British make their final offer. A 26-county Ireland, to be known as the Irish Free State, will be granted Dominion status. The exact position of the border between the Free State and Northern Ireland will be the subject of future review. Irish politicians and public servants will have to take an oath of allegiance to the British King. Britain will retain control of some Irish ports for its navy. Ireland must pay a share of Britain's public debt. Now, Lloyd George issues an ultimatum. Sign or return to war. It wasn't the Republic that Pierce had proclaimed outside the GPO in 1916. That was not on offer. But when Lloyd George made the demand that the delegates make up their mind quickly, they decided, we know what is available, we know what isn't available. This is the best deal available. We are plenipotentiaries appointed by the Doyle. We have full authority. We will sign. For Michael Collins, the decision is a pragmatic one. The treaty gives us not the ultimate freedom that all nations aspire to, but the freedom to achieve it. On January 7th, 1922, Dáil Éireann narrowly ratifies the treaty and the Irish Free State is established. Five days later, British troops begin to withdraw from Ireland. 
On January 16, 1922, Dublin Castle, the historic seat of British power in Ireland, is handed over to the Irish Provisional Government. This is a major moment in Anglo-Irish relations. It is a recognition by the British that the 700 years game is up. The withdrawal of British troops is a major symbolic moment for most nationalists. Tangible evidence of what has been achieved. The departure of the British forces meant that the dream had become the reality. They had won. But the terms of the treaty split the independence movement. And the Irish Free State is contested from the start by many Republicans, including Eamon de Valera. I couldn't swallow an oath of allegiance to the King of England. Couldn't swallow it. I couldn't do it. Not for a million pounds could I do it. Not for all Ireland could I do it. Manny and Cumann Amon and the IRA refused to wait for an all-Ireland republic to be achieved at some future date. If you've been on the hillside, if you've been in ambushes, you know, if you've seen comrades killed, if you've killed yourself, you're saying, no, that's too long. It has to be in my lifetime. It has to be in my young lifetime. And so there's an all or nothing mentality that some of them will have. A bitter, hard-fought civil war breaks out between those who accept the treaty and those who stand against it. The only emotions of the people in the civil war that I seem to remember are those of hatred. I actually saw two brothers, one with an axe and the other with the hammer, trying to attack each other. Well, there was blood everywhere. Atrocities are committed by both sides. Much of the national infrastructure is destroyed. Scores of anti-treaty IRA prisoners are executed by the new state. Before the war ends, Michael Collins, chairman of the Irish Provisional Government, is killed in an ambush in West Cork. He is among the estimated 1,500 people who lose their lives in 11 months of fighting. In May 1923, Eamon de Valera and the Republicans admit defeat and abandon military operations. Though the civil war is over, it leaves a legacy of political divisions that will last for generations. Now, the difficult process of state building can begin. But the Ireland that emerges in the Free State's early years disappoints many of the radicals. Many of the most radical thinkers of 1916 and the period after that had died. They were no longer on the political scene or they were on the losing side of the civil war. Ireland kind of turns in on itself and it becomes very socially conservative. The visionaries take a back step. The dreams of a free Ireland, the dreams of a Gaelic Ireland, the aim of the Workers' and Small Farmers' Republic, the egalitarian promise of the 1916 proclamation, the idea of a free Ireland in all the ways they imagine that in social terms, in cultural terms, in economic terms. Did all that come to pass? No. Look what we got in the end. It wasn't a change. We lost the North and we lost the language. We fought for real, real equality for everybody.
Revolutions are, are utopian projects. They're about a sense of possibility for the future. Independent states are about the prosaic realities of state power. As you go from revolutionary expectation to the realities of statehood, all revolutions fail on some level. But in time, the treaty does provide a path to independence. The Constitution of 1937 excludes all mention of a British monarch and gives the Irish people complete sovereignty over the 26 county state. In 1949, Ireland leaves the British Commonwealth and declares itself a republic. And in 1955, the Republic of Ireland takes a seat at the United Nations as a fully sovereign state. Its unique history a source of inspiration for anti-colonial movements across the world. The fact that the Irish were able to break away to the extent that they did was a great encouragement to Indians, to Egyptians, Burmese and others. And they did say, we too can do it. Ireland was the first domino to fall. The revolution in Ireland, it's definitely a catalyst towards the demise of the British Empire, without a doubt. For the next 50, 70, 80 years, when the Irish went abroad, they were very much greeted by people who had been colonized as comrades. And the Irish struggle was very much recognized and appreciated by people who also struggled against the empire. The partition of Ireland endures. Catholic nationalists in Northern Ireland feel abandoned. Civil rights agitation in the 1960s is followed by three decades of armed conflict. In which three and a half thousand people are killed before a hard won peace is finally established in the late 1990s. Today, the Republic of Ireland is a stable, democratic and internationally respected state. Its people continue to strive to interpret and realize the ideals espoused 100 years ago by the men and women of the revolution, through whose efforts the Republic was born. The freedom to achieve freedom presents an ever demanding challenge, inviting constant redefinition by the generations to come. Is born to me in a reke yoing lemash. Achan hulundas lefang gal.